Um, we have Jeff here from, from Tasting Table. Um, he used to work with UBS as their business manager in asset-backed financing. Um, he graduated from University of Chicago and he was formerly a business analyst at Deloitte Consulting. Decided that was not for him, dropped it all and started Tasting Table, which is an awesome, awesome newsletter for anyone involved. Um, and the food scene or like has an interest in the places to go, um, place to eat. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce him. Thank you. I didn't know I was a featured speaker. This is like now I have like a lot of pressure on me, so I apologize. Um, <clears throat> cool. Thank you. Uh, so I never got an intro in my life. I'm Jeff. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tasting Table uh, tonight, and I want to take the spin on it of describing it from the perspective of an entrepreneur. We just you know, saw a great example of what's for SUP, and he's a little bit earlier in his process. We're about four years old. Uh, tell you what Tasting Table is and kind of a little bit of the thinking that went into it. So if all startups are based on some kind of universal truth, uh, the initial truth for Tasting Table was that all around me around 2008 were 20-somethings to the left and right at every restaurant who normally would be talking about what movie they saw yesterday, last weekend or what Bravo television show they were watching. And instead are talking about East Coast oysters versus West. And have you been to this restaurant? And did you hear that that sous chef just got promoted? Uh, I think the truth around 2008 that was kind of hitting us in the face was that foodieism, I hate the term foodie, it's very contentious, but people know what it means, this deep interest among uh, young people about food and drink, not just where their food and drink comes from in a kind of feel-good way, but as a social outing, as a hobby, uh, was growing. Uh, to the extent that, if you think about it, if you ask most bankers or lawyers who are early in their careers who don't have a lot of time, uh, their hobby is usually something around foodieism because it's the only thing that they have to do every day. So. All of their conversation is about how they went to this restaurant or that restaurant, and they dined here, they dined there, right? That's the universal truth. Uh, New York Magazine actually did a nice job for the sake of my presentation not too long ago. They did an entire long, uh, somewhat hilarious article about foodieism, and their pull quote here is, when did young people start spending 25% of their paychecks on pickled lamb's tongues? I think that kind of says it all right there. Uh, so what we decided to do in 2008 was essentially create daily candy for foodies. Um, who here does not know what daily candy is? Cool. We'll get there in a second. Um, I was connected to uh, Bob Pittman. If you don't know who he is, he's the guy who created MTV. He ran AOL up until the, the uh, Time Warner merger. They owned Daily Candy they, uh, for, I think, eight of its years uh, and then sold it to Comcast. It was a newsletter about sample sales, about things, uh, restaurants that are opening tomorrow, et cetera. Uh, Bob Pittman at the time said to me he wanted to create Daily Candy for foodies. It inspired me to start thinking about this, and where we kind of ended up is, if you can see any of this, um, we decided that we were going to position ourselves not around reporting to people about what the next restaurant is that's opening tomorrow that they have not been to yet, but rather aiming a little bit higher toward that kind of youngish 30-something who has rising disposable income, who has, as I like to say, more money than time, who's not looking to hear what some press release told them is the restaurant that's opening tomorrow, but rather a place that we've gone and tried and can tell them we think is delicious. So this is a little bit of a confusing slide. It's, I'm sure you can guess, uh, pulled out of our advertising sales deck. But in terms of the positioning, to explain where we decided to kind of put Tasting Table on the, on the roadmap, if you think of this two by two, where kind of food expertise, or let's just call it, I'm gonna be really frank with you guys, even though this is being recorded. The quality of the content that is being shared on the um, uh, y-axis is kind of credibility, high-end magazines with lots of people and big budgets at the top, and then user-generated content, think of like in the recipe space, all recipes. Anybody can go up and post a recipe at the bottom, and on the x-axis, left to right, you're thinking about passive content, Lean back content, a magazine, I'm on my couch, I'm on a plane, sitting back, flipping through a magazine in a passive state of mind versus easy to action or lean forward content, what we're used to in front of our computers all day, where I can click to make a reservation, click to buy a bottle of wine. If you think of that, you've got kind of magazines like Food and Wine and Bon App and Savoir over there on the top left. You're leaning back, but my God, that is gorgeous content, $40,000 
photo shoots. This is beautiful stuff. I love it, and it's not very easy to do something with. I can dog ear pages. I can rip them out and hand them to an assistant and say, make me a reservation. But at the end of the day, this is semi, this is, this is passive. And then you think about blogs that are posting 10 posts per day, right, that are telling you about places that are open, uh, opening tomorrow, et cetera, and their, their approach is, oh, it's all digital. So if something's wrong, right, if a phone number's wrong, I can always just go and change it later. That's a lot of content, but that's not very high quality. And then over here, I mean, sure, deal sites and whatnot. I know it's, it's all, uh, it serves a great purpose and all of that. Easy to action, but again, the quality's not there. It's all user-generated content. What we said was that we wanted to bring the tradition of the print journalism world when it comes to food journalism into the easy to action world of digital. And that means uh, journalism that's written by experienced food journalists who know the food scene. That means having on staff copy editors who actually make sure that everything is kind of in a nice style. On staff fact checkers who ensure that all of the things that we're writing are true. Uh, expense accounts for the editors so that they go and anonymously dine at the restaurants. Those guys that he was just making fun of from Los Perros Locos. Uh, let's call them critics, but not kind of snobby critics, but people whose job it is to go and try all of these places and then report to our members just the places that we think they should be spending their time on. Not necessarily expensive, because if you think of somebody who really loves to eat and drink, you'll eat in the, at the food truck if, or the, the street meat cart if it's delicious for two bucks all the way up to the $200 tasting menu. But I want to just pivot for a second in my conversation about the idea that critics will go away or that uh, I, I'm not offended, but I just want to point something out. Though when I have very little time in my life and I'm looking to go on a date or I'm looking to go out with a friend to a wonderful place, the last thing that I, the last opinion that I care about to lead me to what might potentially be a sublime experience is a statistically derived average of what everybody else happens to think about that experience. God bless the God, I'm glad that they got bought. God bless Yelp and everybody's star systems. But the problem with all of that is that when you take an average of thousands of people's experience, you end up with a kind of average opinion. And if you think back to that amazing dinner that you had in Queens that sometime that you decided to go off on an adventure or that romantic dinner that you had at some cafe somewhere where everything kind of aligned, that was not based on an average experience, the average of many people's experiences. What that was was your taste being fulfilled at that time. And I do believe that there's room for that, especially at the high end of the media market where we're playing, the, the luxury media market. I'll make that a little bit clearer in a second. So how do we do all this? What is it? So we say that we're the premier digital, uh, digital media brand uh, serving influential foodies. Um, how do we do that? Very simply, you go out to tastingtable.com or tastingtable.com slash join, uh, and you get this little site that kind of has some call to action. If you saw an ad somewhere that helps you to identify that you're a foodie, you give us your email address, you give us your zip code. We do a quick reverse uh, look up on your zip, and if you are within 20 miles of one of these cities up here, we will just flag you with that edition. Uh, we're publishing uh, 11 different editions every day. We have a full-time editor, um, somebody with a food journalism background who is paid a great salary and has very expensive benefits, eating and drinking all over the cities up there all day long, trying to find the places that are worth your time. If your zip code is not one of these, we also have a national edition. Uh, if you're in a city edition, that means the, the recommendations you'll get each day right around lunchtime are probably about restaurants and wine shops and cook shops and bars, um, all timely and relevant and tested. Uh, if you're in the national edition because you're living in, in Poughkeepsie or someplace uh, or in Austin, you're going to hear more about things you can enjoy anywhere. So wines uh, that are all over the place, new cocktail trends, and then in the restaurant space, uh, we'll talk about trends that are kind of at all of the big buzzy restaurants across the country with the actionability being that we have a food uh, department working out of the test kitchen in Soho that will develop a recipe from one of those restaurants. So you can, not only five years ago, bacon is on every menu, oh my God, and here is this bacon marmalade from this restaurant in Chicago that you can try at home. So that's the essential kind of span of, of, of our content. Uh, we're writing about, we're telling foodies at the end of the day, one recommendation at a time, uh, we're giving them recommendations about where they eat, where they cook, how they entertain, 
uh, the kind of gifts that they buy. Um, we do a lot of foodie gift guides that are very popular. Uh, and then where they travel, because you think about the lowest common denominator among all travelers is that you read it, eat at restaurants when you get to the other side, right? It's the general idea. Um, this is very small, but you're all going to be signing up for Tasting Table by the end of the conversation, so you'll see it. Uh, and this is actually our old email format. It's even more beautiful than this. But what you can see here is the general idea is it's about a 150-word recommendation that we serve up. So it's very fast. Um, you get it. You're not going to save this for later. You're a busy person. You're going to read the first few lines. You're interested. You're going to keep going. Since it's only 150 words, it's, I always tell the editors it needs to be like a poem. Every word has to count, and it has to be so easy to read that once you get going, you won't stop. Uh, in this case, we're making a restaurant recommendation about something in Park Slope. I don't remember when this is. Uh, as you can see, it's surrounded by um, advertising. Uh, at the bottom there, we've got this thing called Dining Dispatch, where we're telling you whatever restaurants opened, closed, or had some major news the day before so that you're aware of what the openings and closings are. But don't go yet, because we haven't recommended it. If it's opening, we're going and we're trying it. And if it's good, soon you'll be receiving a recommendation about it. This is, a, this is the product. This is the entire product. The business model, and getting to kind of what's special about this. Um, I would lay out how this works, um, and it is working. We're very, I'm very proud of it. Um, in terms of the luxury media business 101, think of magazines <clears throat> back in their heyday. What do you do? You create high quality content at the lowest cost possible. That's the secret sauce. Uh, in order to attract a high quality audience, and then you keep serving up that content in a way in a consist consistent ways so that can maintain a relationship with this person and hopefully have some large amount of mind share with them. And then the way that you pay for all of this is that you sell access to that audience to high-end advertisers. Very basic, right? But if you stop for a second and you think about the problems that we have in digital media these days where it's very hard. I mean, I don't want to be a jerk and like name names, but Tasting Table launched in October of 2008. If you know anything about the digital food space, uh, you can probably, within a few seconds, think of five or six very big, flashy companies that launched that ha in the digital media space, uh, in the food space, uh, that dumped in. I mean, I'm not going to name any names, but one is flailing right now that had over $15 million invested, right? There are a lot of places that were doing things exactly in this space. We took a $1 million investment, became profitable by the end of year two, and have bootstrapped all the way uh, since then. And the question I usually get at these things is, well, how is that possible versus websites that are producing so much more content, et cetera? And the answer to that for me is that we have taken the, the lessons of the heyday of the magazine world and applied them to a digital format. Every day when a website, a food website, the editor of a food website goes to bed, uh, if he had 100,000 visits to his site, when he goes to bed, he wakes up in the morning, he has to figure out how to get those 100,000 people to come back, and then hopefully some more. The beauty of the subscriber model is that every night when I go to bed, I go to bed with 100,000 members. That sounds disgusting. I go to bed um, having 100,000 Tasting Table members, and when I wake up, I have 100,000 members, minus a few who unsubscribed overnight, and I have a chance to grow from there. That's how we went from 50 members, mostly friends, in October of 2008, to one and a half million people who receive Tasting Table every day today. Um, and to the Los Perros Locos guy, I will give you an example of what uh, the difference is, what, why it matters when Tasting Table writes about you. Uh, how many people have, here have been to the amazing place Brooklyn Fair? Does everybody know Brooklyn Fair is anybody? Uh, Brooklyn Fair is this uh, great chef's table. Uh, it's gotten a lot of attention. Now it's very expensive. In 2009, when uh, Cesar Ramirez opened it, it was not getting very much attention. Tasting Table had only 30,000 members at that time. Uh, we sent out an email because it was one of those crazy, sublime experiences. I think he was charging $50 for his like 10-course uh, tasting menu for 18 people right in his kitchen. Uh, he credits us to this day for having launched that business, which has grown multifold, because he was only doing it a few days per week at that point. He sold out months and months off of one tasting table email that went to 30,000 people. We now regularly sell places out, knock people's servers offline. When we write about them, we give them warning, et cetera, because the power of this is that if you're serving up high quality content and these folks try it, like it, and begin to trust you, now you don't have to go and look through Chowhound and try to find that nugget of a great idea, or you don't have to go through Yelp and you, know, you don't have a lot of time to figure out whose opinion here do I trust versus whose don't I. I mean, you often look at these reviews and you think from their, their diction or from their grammar, you think, I don't know if this person's opinion really matters that much to me. It's very simple. You're at your desk. You're busy. It's 1130. You're getting hungry for lunch. 
boom, your tasting table email arrives, you're going out to dinner anyway on Thursday, why don't I make a reservation? That's the, that's the basic idea. How we do that, number one, I told you, high quality journalism, we only hire food journalists. Uh, we uh, just hired uh, about six months ago for our new San Francisco editor, uh, Jonathan Kaufman, who was the last still masked uh, food critic uh, for, uh, in San Francisco. It was a big deal when we hired him and they published his photo because every other uh, San Francisco restaurant critic that was a known entity. Um, and all of those folks are very well supported. Like I said, they have uh, Tasting Table credit cards so that they can go out and try the restaurants that we're talking about. And yes, they can try something and then decide they're not going to write about it. That is a rare thing in our space. Uh, uh, in terms of audience quality, Surprise, surprise, uh, people who obsess about where they eat and drink, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when you've got the bottom of the pyramid taken care of, the things that you worry about get a little bit less producty and a little bit more experiential. This is a high-end audience. It's a 60-40 female-male split. It's about $120,000 household income, which in digital is very, very high. Here in New York, it's over $225,000 household income. And these are all simply people who saw Facebook ads that said, are you a foodie, signed up, uh, I think our qualifier on Facebook is we only advertise to you if you are 21 plus uh, and college educated. That's it. All of those folks blend down to a relatively attractive audience to advertisers. Uh, in terms of consistent relationship, we're sending an email five days per week to you. That means you're an essentialized audience of folks who care about this because you'd be really annoyed if you're not a foodie and you get five emails from me a week. You're going to either unsubscribe or you're going to be a lazy shit and you're going to click the spam button. But fuck you, because Gmail loves us, and they know we're not spammers, so they actually send us a little message on the back end, and they gracefully tell us to unsubscribe you, even if you click the spam button. Um, that's, what, that's what you get for building your list from 50 people every day, a little bit more. They're actually good people. Um, uh, but across the balance of that, everybody doesn't read it every day. We're all busy people. On average, the average number has 15 to 20 interactions with Tasting Table a month. You don't have to remember to come to our website. We come to you. That's the beauty of it. Uh, and how does that work in terms of uh, monetizing Tasting Table? We're going to do about $10 million in revenues this year. Um, we're privately owned, so I won't say the profit margin is, but we, it's a very nice media profit margin that's not very common for um, uh, digital media uh, uh, plays. You know, if there's not an e-commerce component, folks are usually having trouble figuring out how to pay the bills. And these are a smattering of advertisers who have advertised at least three times with us. There are folks on here like uh, Chase for the Sapphire card that have um, spent millions of dollars with us and keep coming back for more. Uh, we're about to launch uh, some um, luxury automotive advertising that uh, you guys would all recognize. But this is our audience. And the truth, the universal truth is not based on us having gone out and found one and a half million high-end people. We chose foodieism and high-quality content as a way to attract these folks and keep them. Behind the scenes, as I just told you, um, we're about... Uh, I, I, this is my colleague who's dying laughing over here. What's so funny? Is my fly open? Uh, I think we're 42 people or something. Yeah, 42. I think we're about 42 people right now. Um, very proud of what we created over the last four years. Uh, very proud that it's based on one recommendation at a time. And I hope that your wrong critics are uh, going to go away. Uh, and most importantly, I hope that you'll all pull out your mobile devices and go to tastingtable.com and click the sign up button. No joke, if you don't like it and you unsubscribe, you will never hear from us again. We have great technology on the back end. We've never been hacked. We're not selling your email address to anybody. Feel free to sign up. If you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. Um, I was told to give you that spiel and then say immediately, we're going into questions. Does anybody have any questions? Los Perros Locos guy, what do you want to ask? I have no questions. Do you address all my, my uh... we do have a question over here. Hello. Uh, I, I hear what you said about the email being the product. Do you have a back end where you aggregate those emails online? Do you have a large website presence? Yes. So in our ecosystem, the email is the sun in our ecosystem. It is the thing that we monetize. Uh, I should also say, by the way, the click-through in advertising in, in a tasting yeah. table email is about 10 times the internet average because these people are very interested in this subject matter. The advertising on my website is internet average. So we charge a very high CPM to advertise the tasting table because of that performance in the email. But my website is mostly tools. So we have a restaurant finder. If you just you don't even have to download our mobile app, though I hope you will. If you just go to tastingtable.com on your mobile app, we have a nearby function. Um, we have a restaurant finder. We have the tasting table to-do list. So you can click save this on any recommendation we make and access it on your phone or on the web later. We have a complete archive of everything that we've ever sent out. 
We have a very advanced recipe search engine with over a thousand exclusive recipes from restaurants that we've tested and developed for you. But in our ecosystem, the email is the center and the, the website and all of those products, social media, hundreds of thousands of followers across about 10 Twitter feeds by city, Facebook, et cetera, Pinterest, all of that stuff is the extra stuff that we do to, to provide service for our members to take our recommendations out of the inbox and into the street. Uh, probably not anytime soon, simply because we've decided that from our advertising model perspective, I hate that this is a business discussion, so I'm going to be really frank with you. Um, our advertisers went immediately from, from local to regional to national very quickly. And those big national advertisers you saw, when they ask us for a targeted buy for what we do, they're asking for New York, LA, San Fran, Chicago, DC, and Miami. Um, for me to add additional cities like Boston requires that I hire another highly paid editor. It's more expense. It's a fly in, uh, when, you know, three times per year for our strategy sessions. Just from a business perspective, it doesn't make too much sense at the moment versus putting our resources toward growing what we do nationally. Yes, sir. So, what's your strategy for growth? Bigger, better, faster, meaner, leaner, cheaper if possible. Uh, for us at the moment, what that means is growing our national size, one and a half million people. We're going to be about two million by the end of this year. There's no reason why that can't be in a, a, at least another million the year after. But for us, that's going to be continuing to do a better and better job in what we deliver to the national audience, since that's the cheapest audience to grow, right? Both from my advertising out to people to say, are you a foodie? Join us. Um, and also from the perspective of creating one extremely high quality article and being able to monetize that against a lot of eyeballs. Nothing works like Facebook. We spend about almost a million dollars a year marketing tasting table to various formats across partnerships and also paid media. Um, Facebook is not what it used to be. We used to be a uh, Facebook case study, as a matter of fact, uh, in uh, 2009, because uh, we were just dumping money into the thing for, and having an amazing result. It's become a little bit more complicated. Uh, but you know, sending a dedicated email to New York Magazine's A-list or Chicago Magazine's um, uh, email list, sometimes those types of things work. And then sometimes just big partnership deals where we'll do a sweepstakes opportunity. Uh, we are the only major media partner of William Sonoma for our Sous Chef series. Uh, William Sonoma blasts several million people every month with an opportunity to sign up for Tasting Table for our sous chef series that we do with them that results in tens of thousands of new, very high quality, high household income ad, um, ads, meaning additional subscribers, things like that. But you know, Facebook has, you know, to this day, been the majority of the uh, targeted, uh, uh, the most targeted way for us to bring high quality members on. Hi. Besides restaurants, do you concentrate on uh, food events? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we're doing our own food events. It's uh, totally sold out if, if you didn't know about it. Uh, it's called the Lobster Roll Rumble. Uh, we bring 20 lobster rolls from all over the country uh, to compete at a tasting event on June 6th at the Metropolitan Pavilion. 1,400 ticketed guests all wear RFID bracelets that are hooked up to their Facebook and Twitter, and they taste their way through all 20 rolls while enjoying Stella Artois, Lef, Bordeaux, um, Don Julio Tequila, voting for their favorite. Uh, amazing event. Sold out in uh, 1,400 tickets in five days. Uh, very expensive. $250 ticket for a VIP early access, $150 for regular. Uh, in five days it sold out this year. We're doing our first lobster roll rumble in Los Angeles, brought to you by the Anheuser-Busch family of beers, the Tastemakers beer, um, <laughs> in October. Any other questions? Did that make any sense? I talked really fast. Uh, my email address is there. Uh, if you have any questions, I can help you in any way. If you have any complaints, uh, drop me a note. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, thanks to these uh, Brooklyn Tech Startup dudes, too, because this is an awesome forum.